Well, it's great to be here. I'm just looking for a little place from my bottle. Here we go. And, um, and I love this place. Um, and I'm going to talk about machines. How do we find comfort with machines? What does it mean when buildings become machines? I guess I have to do a lot of exercise in this talk. I see that I have to keep on looking. I can't just look in front of me. Um, what does it mean when buildings become machines in cities? And what does it mean when cities become a machine, as in intelligent cities? One issue that immediately uh, needs to be brought to the fore is that actually we love our machines, but then we also hate some machines. But I am not against machines. I would sink without the machines that I'm attached to. I'm not quite as far as loving the hum of servers. I'm not as far as loving the space where all the servers are and the cables. But I can also understand that part. So this is not against machines. This is the question of how does the multiplication, the proliferation of machines and machine-like buildings and machine-like infrastructures within which we, leave, we live function in a context such as a city, a messy city, a big city, when the city is, by definition, incomplete. There is no such thing as a real city that is complete. Is there a mismatch, a foundational mismatch, between the notion of bringing more and more machines, taking it to the extreme of whole intelligent cities, when the city is incomplete? One of the reasons I think that the city has outlived empires, kingdoms, republics, multinational corporations is because it is incomplete. So I think that that is actually a foundational issue. Ah, there goes my talk, flying, nice. Um, it is a foundational issue that we have to deal with. We are not going to get rid of machines. We will use more machines. And there will be embedded software everywhere. So it is not a question of saying out with the machines. That we can do in certain settings, but not in these complex cities. It's all right. <laughs> um, so one, one issue, like a first point to, to mark it is, if we think of the intelligent city, in other words, you, you know what I'm talking about, a city that is chock full with sensors. I say sensors with S though of course it is at serious risk of becoming sensors with a C, which is a slightly different matter. But what, <laughs> what happens when some of these machines, these systems, let's think systems, technical systems, become obsolete? Does the city collapse and become this? All these, I hope that everybody can see it. This is from a Chinese artist. I have the, the name there. All these fancy, he took literally photographs of real buildings that are supercharged with technologies of all sorts and made them crash. Would actually a whole intelligent city become incomplete? Now, I want to arrive at the end of the talk, and I hope that we can have a bit of discussion because these are open questions. I don't have all the answers. I'm just exploring this. And I think they are serious issues. Right now, as we sit in this great structure, hundreds of cities are being built. And hundreds are on the drawing board. And the model of the intelligent city is the dominant model. So we, we are living an epoch where many cities, not most cities, there are millions and millions of cities in the world, that's a very massive presence, but many cities, many of the new cities, many of the cities in rich countries 
and many of the cities for the rich in poor countries are going to be intelligent cities. We don't want this kind of collapse because so much complexity in a quasi-closed system, these technological systems are clearly not completely closed, but they are sufficiently closed that they are subject to an obsoleteness that the city in its incompleteness can actually avoid, can navigate, which is quite extraordinary. So when I look at this, this these are buildings that for me are a machine. You cannot even hack them. And by hack I mean that you can alter the technical model, the technology, etc., to which they respond. Then I prefer a machine that can be hacked, an oil rig made into a city. I prefer that way to go than the other way. Here is another detail. Again, I have these, these are great projects, so I have the footnotes are there. I don't know if you can see them, but I, uh, I'm not going to bother naming all the names. Very often, we have this. I don't even know, but many, some of you do. How do we even begin to hack this? What was done to the oil rig is a way of hacking to, I'm using hacking in a metaphoric sense. It altered the genus technology that is embedded in the oil rig and made it. How, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? But here is something that I found a great series of images. Hacking the pothole. The artist did not call it that, that is my name. So here, this is a way of hacking the pothole. There is the pothole. Is this the proverbial hole where Alice disappeared in Wonderland following the rabbit? Here, making wine in the pothole, jumping on the grapes, fishing. I show all of these because these are micro ways of actually hacking something that looks immutable, a pothole in a street of asphalt. But we can do. Now we need to go well beyond this in order to, um, to get anywhere close. So now I want to sort of run with you through, through a series of sort of arguments, partly, partly studied quite in, in some detail by me and partly still arguments. And the first thing I want to, to argue is that one way of not rejecting these technologies, I'm really to a very large extent talking about computer-centered, interactive technologies. I'm not talking about data pipelines. I'm talking about something that can produce a form of the social. And I like to use this word socialité, you know, a thin social. Not the social of the neighborhood where you know everything and you know how, how at what time your neighbor gets up and you run into the street and you already share so much past. No, a thin sociality. Like frankly, very often we find in social media, you know, those interactive spaces. So when you think of the intelligent city, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of interactivity between you and machines, spaces, interactive spaces, etc. A kind of social, some version of the social is constituted that way. But it is not a thick social. It is not the social that we know of our neighborhood. It is a thin social. So a first sort of strategy, a first tactic, is this notion that I brought in the, in the title, you know, what would it mean to talk back to your intelligent city? What could that actually mean? And so the notion, of course, of hacking the intelligent city, as illustrated with the very innocent and pretty notions of hacking the pothole, is clearly one possibility. You know, some way of altering the technological format, the technological closure. What kind of an urbanism do we get that way? And 
I like this image, I love this image of a kind of open source urbanism. What would an open source urbanism mean? Let me give you an example from New York, which is one that is very familiar to New Yorkers. I don't know how many uh, New York residents are here, but we all recall, those of us who were in New York, uh, Riverside Park. I'm going to give you an example that has nothing to do with technology, but which shows how, through a thin sociality, people's practices collectively can alter and remark a space. And the notion is, can we do that also vis-a-vis -vis some of these systems? Not all of them. Some of them we don't want to bother with, but those that are a bit oppressive, let's say, that are a bit in your face. And, and in order, again, to avoid that massive obsoleteness that could bring us all down, so to speak. Riverside Park, in the 70s, in the late 70s, when New the Upper Side, you know, Upper West Side, when New York was rather poor, New York was bankrupt, uh, the financial system basically took over the finances of the city, did more or less okay in that case. Uh, Riverside Park was a place that was beautiful from a distance. Nobody wanted to go there. It is also the epoch when you have the move of a lot of young professionals, etc. And there was a lot of cheap housing to be had with great views over the river, etc., etc. So what did these people do? They did go there. They had dogs to protect themselves because it was so unsafe. Well, dogs need to be walked. In a sort of amorphous, collective way, they began to walk their dogs in the park. There was no Twitter. It was not a convocation. Let's go walk our dogs. No, it happened because they each had their own little house with their own little dog. That's how it is a bit. And so they had to walk those dogs. And in walking the dogs, they made the park theirs. In other words, no central command, no communication, thin sociality, not because they knew each other well, and they altered the park. Now, anybody who lives in a big city has many of these stories. Now, the city is also the space where all kinds of abuses happen, inequalities, gentrification, et cetera, et cetera, displacements you know, homeless people. I'm not romanticizing the city at all. What I'm sort of bringing to the table is this possibility of altering, of transforming a space in such a radical way with such minimum superstructure. No political class, no leaders, no none of that. No committee meetings, just you are there, you need a dog, the dog you have to walk, etc., and the outcome is there. When we look at slightly more complex issues, uh, it's, I think the same logic can be there. Not in all cases, not for everything. But the one thing I know is that no computer can get you there by itself. And he says it better. <laughs> Just a minute of. <laughs> So it takes much more than a computer. And I would say that is the fatal flaw with these intelligent cities. I'm all for maximizing the use of technology. I really am. I am a bit of a, a bit, a bit, a bit of a techie or a geek, let's say. But, uh, but not in that way. That way is extremely problematic. So with open source urbanism, what could that mean? And here I should say that there are two versions circulating. One is an older notion, which is the one that I've been talking about, which is hacking the city. This is something that has been circulating, you know, and when I said hacking the pothole, etc., those are sort of very elementary illustrations. You can escalate them and they have been escalated much more. But in a way, the whole notion of hacking is to disrupt an existing systematicity, transform it, make it a bit yours, just as the dog walkers did with a park. They did not accept the given, they altered the systematicity of Riverside Park. Now I have another errant idea in my head that I am sort of exploring, which is what would it mean 
for the city to be the hacker. That is different from hacking the pothole. That means that the city, in its full complexity, actually engages the technologies, the systems. And I, I would say we're better right now on hacking the city. Think of all the roof gardens, all the little farms. New York right now is the proud uh, space or owner, you can't quite say owner, of 112 plus farms. Actually more right now, I think. So those are all little ways of hacking, hacking an urban space, hacking something. Uh, but when you think about the city, complex system, it escalates matters. It is a different kind of actor that is going to try to hack the technology. Back to this notion of the, um, of the, the obsoleteness of buildings. That could be, you know, when, when they're chock full with technology, the technologies become obsolete, that whole space in a city could actually become obsolete. That image number one. Um, what would it mean for us confronted with all kinds of systems? And we can actually also think of non-interactive systems like transport systems that need to be changed. It's very interesting to see how immigrants, when they come to a city, produce their own transport systems. When there is no transport system, they, they arrange them. They arrange because there is neighborhood effect, there is collectivity, there is shared needs, etc., etc. So I think that these are all extremely interesting ways whereby you, know, you can actually alter something in the space of the city. Open source urbanism. Open source urbanism, the Riverside Park example would be one case that I gave, but there should be many, many ma more ways of doing that. And at the heart of the notion of open source urbanism is both a collective effort without a central committee that plans it, and there is an engagement with the technology. This is very important. So open source, we all know about that, is a fairly well-established practice. Uh, transporting that to the complexity of the city is a very different matter. Transporting that to the notion that the city is the hacker, the city is the one who is going to develop the open source notions, is even more complicated. My sense is that at the heart of open source technology, is a distributed system. It's distributed, multiple nodes, multiple different systems. The city is a distributed space. Yes, we have concentrations, yes, we have enormous inequalities, you know. But it is foundationally a space with multiple nodes, very different nodes, and I wish there were much more democracy than there is, but still, it is multi-sided. There is no center that can stand completely by its own. So in some ways, an open source urbanism is an urbanism that begins from this distributed space. The dog walkers altering the space that is Riverside Park, that is an example that needs to be multiplied. The game that we have here in this uh, exhibit that the, in the lab, the urban knowledgeist game, or whatever it's called, that is also sort of a good exercise to begin to, to try these things. I was part of an effort in Zaragoza with uh, Bill Mitchell, who sadly is no longer with us, uh, a whole MIT team that descended on this little medium-sized city uh, that is Zaragoza, a rather dusty slash dust bowlish, dust bowl? city and the technologist's approach i must say was dominant which meant all right we have all of these technologies the list of possibilities we are going to teach the people of saragossa how to use it the children are and so i by chance i don't know why i thought about it it just came to me and it happened to also be a press conference because it was like a big event so it was a the press, the media were there for the whole country. And I said, well, sure, we're going to 
I'm a bit cantankerous sometimes, so I sort of let go instead of being polite and nice. And I said, sure, we're going to teach them. But we also need to ask, what are the abuelas? Abuelas is a very good word. That means grandmother. But in Spanish, it has a different meaning. Abuela is a real subject, n not grandmother, but abuela. So I said, what are the abuelas of Zaragoza doing? What kinds of practices do they have? Because grandmothers are serious subjects. They have time, they have knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. What are the practices that they're engaged in and how can we bring an online version of what they are already doing? In other words, there is knowledge in all of these actors that don't know anything about technology. How do we make them show uh, the technologists? What are the practices that they're engaged in? Secondly, those practices vary. They vary by neighborhood, they vary by time of the day, you know, a whole variety of such things. So that is a version of open source. That is that you bring in this openness into a technological practice. Now, again, at the level of the city, it cannot be one system. It has to be many systems. It has to be many neighborhoods. It has to be multiple types of people, artists, gardeners, you name it. If we begin to use, to insert in all our practices from the most elementary neighborhood little practice to some other bigger practice, some of these technological ele uh, elements, we are beginning to use the city as a hacker vis-a-vis -vis the technology, rather than simply learning the technology and accepting that sort of role that was the thing that I was contesting in this particular meeting in Zaragoza. Power, big power, that's a challenge. And these complex cities, they always have powerful centers. And their complexity, their openness throughout you know, the centuries, etc. the capacity to rebuild. But guess what? There always is a center of power. What does it mean to hack power? What does it mean to talk back to power is something that I think we are already more familiar with. It's something that we have done. It's something that, you know, we don't, we understand that. Uh, I should make a footnote right now and mention something about, of course, what I refer to as the London riots. And with all the criminality that it was involved, that is, of course, also one very extreme version of talking to power, though it is perhaps some of you might see that as a bit of an embellishment of what was happening there. But we know how to talk to power but confronted with enormously complex systems, technological systems, we shrink back. But in fact, I keep, I keep insisting, there are these, that we don't need to know the full technology. And here is something, a distinction that has mattered a lot in my work. We, the users of the technology, have a different logic from the engineer's logic who designed the technology. The engineer needs to know everything. The user needs to know a bit. And the user brings her own logic to it. So my, my image is a kind of Phillips curve. You can come from totally different angles, global civil society groups, financial actors, whatever. You come from very, very different angles you intersect some moment there where you're both using the technology, but you go again in very different directions. You're using it for different reasons. So all kinds of different users are using these technologies. But, and I repeat, the way they are using it is not necessarily the way the engineer said, this technology can do A, B, C, D. So you get to use A, B, C, D, you should use a, B, C, D. That doesn't happen. That actually rarely happens. Finance needs these technologies, these interactive technologies. Finance today depends, but the logic of finance is not the logic of those technologies. It is a different logic. Now, 
If you multiply that over and over, imagine the intelligent city with all kinds of technological issues there. Each one of us is already de facto, probably, for different purposes in our daily life, etc., using it a bit differently from what the engineer designed it. The risk with these complex intelligence systems is that we're not allowed to do enough of that, that we wind up sort of being a bit enslaved by the massiveness of those technical systems. And that is, I think, the challenge. But I want to repeat again that we're actually already doing it. We do it all the time because we are not respecting fully the, the, the design, you know, the, the issue of the engineer's logic. In other words, it can do A, B, C, D. We may not use A, B, C, D. And by not using A, B, C, D, we are already transforming the technology. It's already a bit of hacking. Now, to me, that is a first step towards, you know, getting to, to engage, and especially when it's interactive technologies, some of these technical systems. It's a little first step. It's not a big first step, but it is something. And again, I want to show this extraordinary image of this Chinese artist. And this is precisely what we want to avoid. When you think of a city like Istanbul, you think of Mumbai, even New York, hundreds of years of existence, outliving powerful systems. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't become obsolete. And so, and again, this one, which is my favorite, um, it shouldn't wind up there in some sort of uh, cemetery of obsolete technical systems housed in the buildings where we live and we work. So, yes, some of this technology is fantastic. I mean, I really like it, but at the same time, we need to keep talking back to it. We need to not think that, oh my God, we should use everything that the engineer has told us. And I think engineers are great, by the way. Again, this is not a criticism of engineers, clearly. And, um, and, and in that sense, I think through a collectivity of actions, again, back to the park, no central committee organizing it, no Twitter to convoke, through a variety of mechanisms that are part of urbanity, that are part of cityness, we actually are already, I think, in a first phase of continuously doing that. And there is a real sense, this whole movement, the right to the city, the notion that, you know, whose city is this, the, the, the claim making around urban space. These are multiple forces, and they are enacted, and in enactments, subjects are made that are already taking us into this first step. But I will say, at the end, I think that this question of intelligent cities, the way we're going, the way these are being made by extremely powerful and rich corporations are very problematic. And so we need to harness, in a way, these technical capacities, all that it gives us, before it gets housed in complex, de facto closed systems. No matter all the feedback loops that they have, de facto vis-a-vis -vis the city, vis-a-vis -vis the incompleteness of the city, these are closed systems. That final step, we should sort of stay on this side of. But we then need to take a, a, a kind of cognizance that we are already engaging in mini, mini hacking all the time because we're not simply executing the engineer's project. And I think that is a very interesting thought, actually, that we are already engaged in all of this. Now, um, I, I mean, I, I also do think that we have to go much further than we, where, we, where we are at now. And I think it is not only about the technologies, but these interactive technologies are very important. They can add a lot to our life, and we need to sort of harness these types of energies without succumbing to some sort of pre-shaped system. One of the major challenges is the vast amount of money that is uh, made by now building whole cities. So, you know, your average new intelligent city, I'm dying to ask you, how much do you think that would cost? Well, a little one, Right now, they're still little, 
which makes them also stranger, so that the risk of obsoleteness is enormous. A little one costs you about $50 billion. Um, and it doesn't house too many people. This is a problem. There are enormous vested interests right now which want material products. In this case, the material product is a whole city. Because where are you going to put your money? Into, into finance? Not right now. Land is the other major, you know, 70 million hectares of land have been bought since two, between 2006 and 2010. And the major buyers right now in sub-Saharan Africa are hedge funds. So this issue of intelligent cities it's a major one. It's a great investment. China alone has 400 cities that it's building, with 100 right now being built. But they, they're intel that's too expensive to do this fancy intelligent because they need cities with three to five million people. When it's that big, you know, it's not going to be that fancy. But in many other places, India is planning 100 cities. They risk becoming cities for elites like Abuja in Nigeria, you know, the new capital for the rich. So, so I think we need to think, and, and again, anti, for me at least, and maybe we can fight it out, you know, in discussion, for me being anti-technology is not the way to go. For me the way to go is to, how can the city with its complexity, its incompleteness, which means undetermined logics, indeterminacy, which is an enormous capability in our epoch, how can it, keep hacking the technology. And I leave you with that thought and this quote. And you can fill in whom the references are to. Thank you very much. <laughs>